Okay, I'm going to uh, start here. This is our third class of the 15th week, our last class in Ag Econ 410 this semester. Um, try to get through this uh, quickly for you. Um, so let's start by thinking about what we, what we should talk about at the end of the class. We've had a couple of lectures um, spread through here on sort of what the role of economics is, um, how we might use what we understand to deconstruct problems when someone's making an argument and about policy and incorporating economics, uh, how might we try to decompose or pull that apart and set the, the different pieces against each other because, uh, as we've seen, there's sort of the factual content that is should be agreed upon, and then there could be some portion of it that's the debate over the economic analysis. We all have different assumptions. Um, you know, economics is a framework. It is a, a view uh, about how interactions happen uh, among decision makers, but we may have different ideas about how quickly someone responds, and so that would mean um, either demand or supply is changing differently, and then we may even have a, a different understandings about how the technology that allows someone to respond fat quickly on the supply side changes. So there could be some sort of economics debate. We tend to try to resolve those with empiricism. So we estimate, we collect more data that is relevant, and we try to do tests. And then we have the third debate, or sorry, the second piece of the debate, which we should try to separate from economics, which is about values. And so we had that lecture, then we, we followed up with another one on sort of institutions uh, and the roles they play um, as uh, a construct in policy, right? And that's where we talked about sort of where, who are the commenters and who might we be decomposing or deconstructing if we start taking their words, they're mostly policy focused, they use economics as a tool, if we consider ourselves to be the economist, how would we deconstruct it for, for economic uh, analysis? And then finally, we have our lecture on, our sort of wrap up lecture on problems and policy. Okay, so the first thing I'll tell you is uh, you get hired here at Purdue to work in Ag Econ and they take great pride in the students uh, and where they are, what they've accomplished, the sort of leadership role they take in the agricultural community. Uh, and I've been here long enough to see that it's true. It's a good pitch uh, because it's one that, that gets verified over and over, and that'll be you. Um, and so I'll just encourage you with that in mind to continue to use and develop your economics, your thinking through problems that way. It's, it's a good framework. It helps you understand problems. The Purdue sort of tradition is to think of it in terms of alternatives and consequences. So there's always, uh, economics is almost always about decision problems. Uh, and so can you look at which alternatives exist for whatever problem is being looked at or whatever decision has to be uh, made and think through what uh, the potential consequences are and decide which one uh, sort of offers the best path. Um, and then one other thing we should always sort of keep in mind is the idea that uh, uh, at least uh, when we're thinking about consequences, there could be some unintended consequences. Now, they are unintended, so they are by definition not things that are easy to sort of scope uh, out, right? And um, But we do know that certain things leave open more options for unintended consequences to happen. Uh, so that, that could be... Uh, in mind. So uh, think about that. Um, so as you take sort of the economics you've had in this normal, you know, most of your training will have been managerial focused or marketing focused as you move through the Ag Econ department. So we teach you some economics and then you, the applications tend to be on decision making. Uh, how would you think about it in policy and, and why would you think about it in policy as you go forward? Well, Outside of your career in, in life, the way you'll see economics discussed the most is in policy discussion, political discussion, people talking about the state of the world, and uh, could it be better or worse? Well, they'll also often refer to economics. 
So if we start thinking about policy problems as economics problems, then we should acknowledge right away the alternatives and consequences are going to be complex. The direct effect of anything, especially if we think about it as an individual, how does the government changing taxes uh, affect me? Well, it may affect me none, very small. Uh, but the macro, right, when government does that, it's because they're trying to raise revenue across the board over many actors. So the direct effects may be small. The long-run effects may be, may be bigger. I may be having a small direct tax increase um, that uh, when pulled together with everyone else's small tax increase has some sort of positive uh, long-run effect that ends up saving me money, right? Who knows what kind of investments might be made. Uh, the other thing is long run and short run effects may be very different. Political horizons are short. Um, most politicians in this country in the national government are elected every two years. That means they win an election and they have a few months before they start thinking about trying to win another election. And uh, so that that means that they are looking for short run uh, wins lots of times and uh, you know long run things may play out over a different horizon uh, and so short run pain is often avoided in policy for long run horizon because of the political clock uh, that everyone faces and then the other thing to keep in mind politics may attach much higher value to outcomes than standard economics so you know, the overwhelming criticism of economics we put a dollar value on everything, um, and that's how we take our data. But we all know, and economics realizes that everyone makes a decision based on their preferences. Okay, so if you make a long run plan on your business, and if it turns out that profit is not as important to you as maybe some sort of long run legacy, right? That may mean that you take. Uh, someone may be offering you to buy out your company um, at more than its valuation, at more than you can sustain a profit stream for the rest of your life. Uh, but it may be more valuable to you to have that company, have your name on it, have control over it, uh, than to take the higher money. Right. So as a scoreboard, economics uses dollars um, in a lot of our data as a framework or as a theory most of it goes back to utility, something that we acknowledge right from the start we can't count, right? And so it, it's, it's a win and a loss. A win in that economics can now account for most every decision. It's a loss in that we have to make a lot of assumptions to get from the type of data we see, what people bought, how much they paid for it, those kind of things, to the analysis uh, that, that is consistent. Okay, so if we talk through policy problems and we sort of agree economics could be a good framework, and what makes it a good framework is just like management problems, we're talking about trade-offs. So we're looking at some limited decision set that uh, different paths, different options, uh, and so the right way to think about those are what are the trade-offs? What do we gain and lose uh, at the margin if we move between those? So just like uh, corn and soybeans on a returns per acre basis, government spending could be on national defense or national education. We know we pay for both, um, but where does the next dollar go to? That's the marginal decision. Understanding marginal costs and returns is very difficult, assuming a, a fairly ordinary objective, right? How do you trade off national defense versus national education? These are things, you know, every trade off we've done in class with one of our models said, uh, there's a market trade-off that we compare to our preferences. There's a market trade-off that we look at and compare to the technology. There's no market for national defense. There's no market for national education. These are large national public, public good programs uh, that we don't trade on. Okay, so what do we have to look for? Well, we tend to look at the political process and see who wins. Someone who favors national defense, someone who favors national education. And, you know, these are not the only two things, uh, but this is the sort of too good uh, comparison that we might make. So uh, the market we have is sort of a political market. Where do people spend 
their political uh, sort of money or you know funds that they are willing to sort of engage the policy process with, but also votes. You know, votes is sort of the egalitarian part. Uh, everybody gets one. Um, so if we were to keep with this analogy and think about government working like a firm, a firm wants profits or a long-run stream of profits, we'd have to ask what are the government's objectives and how is decision-making being handled? And that's where we get to a topic called political economy. It is not uh, only economics. It is not economics that owns this discipline. Political economy is sort of the joining of political science and uh, economics. So just like uh, forestry management uh, typically involves you know, uh, people who study forestry and people who study economics and, and sort of bridging those two, uh, political economy would be the same. Um, so if we're going to do economics, uh, take an economic sort of decision-making analysis approach to politics and to policy outcomes, then we had to have a, a functional use or a functional uh, method of identifying objectives. Um, yeah, and that means actually pers thinking about the outcome objectives, not the policy objectives. So things that aren't objectives, uh, but they get treated that way. Uh, and you'll hear these if you watch the election over the coming uh, through 2020, right? Universal insurance coverage, uh, building a wall on the southern border, giving people free college, drilling for oil. Those are not problems. Those are those are not objectives, sorry. Uh, an objective is to improve some condition, right? These are all just approaches um, or, or uh, policy options that someone has already claimed, claimed to be the better uh, among the alternatives for addressing some um, objective in a problem or problem area. So universal insurance may be a an approach to improving national health. Building a wall may be for some kind of national population or um, even labor force uh, issues. Free college for a national education. Uh, and drilling for oil may be a national security or energy independence type objective. So these are all sort of objectives. We don't, you know, we try to measure sort of how good is national health and we compare ourselves to other countries. Same thing with education. Same thing with sort of the, the census and population growth rate uh, and, and whatever parts of that. So we are being told, or typically we are being engaged on in pol policy and political debates with ideas uh, and program ideas that go to these, but people are going to be you know, experiencing these as gains or improvements in sort of the average national health, changes in sort of the uh, growth rate in the population, uh, etc. So, what are policy and political objectives? Well, they rarely get stated, right? So, healthcare, immigration, education, and national security are all top line political debate issues, but very few people say, what is the outcome we desire? Um, Universal health coverage, right? So it would be easy for a presidential candidate to say, everyone has insurance. And we could do that tomorrow at very low cost by just saying that insurance is anything we want to call it. And it would have no impact on national health. You know, it's free, but it covers nothing or it covers very little. And so the, the problem is, is, you know, the healthcare political objective must be attached to some sort of national health gains that we're after. Same thing with immigration. What are the targets? What are the target uh, growth rates and where would they be regionally? Right? There are places uh, that are desperate for population growth in this country to maintain what they want, right? They, they live in rural areas. They are spaced out, but they don't, you know, they want to keep schools and fire departments and police and sheriffs and uh, there's not enough people to support that and so they are looking for uh, in migrants either to keep uh, or to keep people there right and so typically to keep people there there has to be some economic growth which usually the fastest way is to get some in migration whether it's other citizens in the country moving there which is why you see um, 
areas and states go so uh, give so many incentives to companies to come and locate there because that will bring in in migrants uh, to come work. So, uh, what would I ask as an economist watching these things when you have your sort of trying to think through these problems in terms of economics, you should notice that few politicians will actually state a vision for what those target outcomes are. They just tell you their proposal is best. And, um, you know, that's a problem. And if you want to start evaluating things in terms of economics or you want to understand why your government or this person representing you uh, is pursuing something, you should be willing to ask that and, and, and go through it. Um, okay, so what are the known and unknown objectives? So political discourse has become relatively unfriendly to the notion of objectives. We had a, a lecture on this where we talked about the farm income problem and how it was defined for the 1940s, 50s, and 60s quite well. And as the farm income problem became less about tracking farm income, which by the 1990s, most of our measures showed to be large compared to sort of average income, uh, or the farm household's income, um, we started changing the objectives and then we finally just started not seeing politicians actually address those. So we, we talk about, a, you know, when we talk about vision for agriculture, they just talk about uh, sort of platitudes um, and seeing a growing agriculture, but they never tell you what rate is the target what would we call a win or a loss in policy? So just like in our recent debate, or not debate, discussion in class, um, where we talked through the trade war, uh, the biggest missing piece of the trade war so far, uh, as it's evolved, is any clear definition of what a win would be, okay? We, we, we've not established that, so we have no idea about when, uh, you know, as economists or analysts or in business, people uh, the uncertainty around it really comes from the fact that we don't know what has to be accomplished to call it a win and to sort of make an agreement to get back in normal trade uh, relations and trade patterns that are governed by mostly uh, comparative advantage. I have a great example I used to talk through when I did more uh, farm policy talks out in the state it was uh, the 2008 Farm Bill. So uh, President Bush at the time was um, his last year in office um, he had asked and asked and asked for a farm bill that went through and found the cuts that they were making in other places in government. And um, they didn't write it, and he was obviously in his last year and not able to run again, so he didn't have a lot of political clout, but he vetoed the farm bill. He vetoed the farm bill because he asked for something and it wasn't there. and then pretty much everyone in Congress voted to override that veto. So we got a farm bill that the president didn't sign because enough of Congress wanted the farm bill as it was written uh, to override or to uh, take away uh, his right to, to kick that out. Um, and then you get this farm bill that's overriding, and then you get record farm incomes over the next five years, and then 2011, 2012, Right after we've been through a financial crisis, you go and look at a bunch of Congress people, Republicans, Democrats, uh, from farm states in agriculture, and they said, look, uh, you should be glad you didn't live through the financial crisis the way most of the economy did. We took care of agriculture, even though the president told us we should be cutting uh, support out from under you. If you went and asked a set of farmers, managers, analysts, economists, how the 20, 2008 Farm Bill that had this override um, made it so that the Farm Bill, so that, sorry, 2008 to 2012 and 13 saw essentially huge increases in farm income while the rest of the economy was struggling, they'd have a tough time telling you what was in there to do that. Uh, they would mostly tell you that uh, oil market and energy market shocks uh, pulled up ag prices and just kept them high. And that, uh, you know, the best case you can make for uh, those legislators who are walking around saying, we we're proud of the work we did in 2008, we will continue to support agriculture even when a president tells us to cut funds because just like President Bush, President Obama was looking to cut spending in, in the farm bill. Um, 
so I used to give this talk and, and we used to just do it and if we were in class we would stop and say what what is in the farm bill that would have countered this and, and you know the story is there's not a lot there's not a lot that you would point to and say the direct cause is Congress uh, the direct cause for five years of, of pretty strong agricultural income is Congress right it's just never the case uh, and especially not then um, okay so political objectives if we were to if we're going to be critical of um, politicians and politics and the entire sort of policy process for not claiming those political objectives uh, sorry claiming that their objectives um, that, that objectives that are targets that they think their policy programs and actions and decisions should meet then we should at least look into the objectives that we can tell they are pursuing and political objectives tend toward um, political power right so maintaining it increasing it uh, but we should keep in mind that any individual pol political actor that could be a candidate or someone in office that we view and hear uh, and you know learn from is part of one first a party you know we have only two parties in this country that are sort of national level uh, you know, electable forces at the moment so they're part of a party that party will have a bunch of different policy priorities and depending on where you are um, your priorities may be very small within the policy um, that actor will be part of that party but also in some legislative body that has another party with completely well not completely different but um, adding on priorities and adding on sort of hurdles that would have to be crossed. And then finally you have that legislative body as part of an elective government where the powers are sort of separated and uh, checked on each other and so you've got all this, you go from the, uh, you know, our congressman in this district, uh, I don't know if you vote here or not, but uh, comes out, gives a speech and says I will do this, this and this. Well, keep in mind uh, that person works within a party and their objectives may not be the ones that get pursued or get time. They work in a legislative body and uh, uh, they, they're, they may get no time at all because of the legislative body they work in and so they may be doing very little other than giving speeches and trying to make uh, the best deals they can, right? And then they work in an elected government where even if the policy passes uh, out of their legislative body it may never see the light of day. which takes us to the idea of feasibility. So we talk about feasibility and economics all the time. There is something called political feasibility. Uh, a politician that wants to balance the budget, right, we hear it all the time, has just declared an objective that is outside of the feasible set. There is no constituency of political actors or voters that says first thing first, let's balance the budget and then let's figure out what we're going to do. Uh, almost always in policy and voters they say first things first don't touch defense then go balance the budget if it's their second priority but it's probably not you have other voters who say don't touch social security don't touch education don't touch energy don't touch uh, you know uh, public universities don't touch uh, snap don't touch this don't touch that and so eventually you have a constituency that says um, yeah, I'm for the balanced budget, but it's like sixth on my list of things that you can't touch, and so you're no longer in a feasible position for this. Um, and, you know, there are people and, and politicians that have advanced the idea of making it constitutional, that the government has to balance the budget, and that would make it a priority, And but that, that amendment to the Constitution has never had a lot of backing, and that's how we know that there are not a lot of political actors or voters who make it a priority. And so we... we end up with a political feasibility problem that someone can say they favor balancing the budget even if I it's my priority it doesn't mean much to me because I know that they have very little ability to do it okay let's head towards uh, uh, a closing uh, here for this uh, short talk to end the semester uh, and we should this lecture was originally called the economist role but uh, I've kind of spread it out uh, and so what is the economist role? So if this is the, the situation, if we are taking our training in economics 
you all have some and uh, I think it's good training uh, how do you how do you keep it up or how do you apply it or how do you sort of see it grow as you view and um, sort of engage with policy problems as you move through your career your life and sort of the idea that um, you know you have stakes in this stuff so think about it um, we, we did this deconstruction and so first of all uh, economics is great for assembling facts right? so most if most of the policy debate uh, is going to be incorporating data that is of economics uh, nature and our sort of accounting uh, frameworks uh, then economics has to be a good uh, framework for trying to organize that information uh, someone showing us prices and the prices are going up uh, and telling us it's a good thing well that, that's okay but we know that price data must come from some supply and demand interaction there must be these drivers there must be something pulling the prices up it's either a shortage on the supply side or a, uh, you know there's something about the demand pulling up prices right or something about the supply being restricted or shortened uh, that is causing that push so so if someone tells us a policy or political story that says I did this and then prices went up well an economist should be ready to ask what did you do right what were the actions that impacted supply or demand in those prices because it's not uh, we are not a we do not have set prices uh, by the government uh, some places do so if you see um, you know someone saying ah the Democrats took over um, uh, the, well I think they won 2018 so they started and now wages have finally started going up well maybe it's connected somehow but we should be asking where are the supply and demand conditions what are the policies that they pursue and it's the same thing if uh, you know, two years before that uh, Republicans took over the White House and and lots of economic things went up GDP um, what did they do what can we point to so try to point not through uh, these sort of broad indicators you know if you read the Wall Street Journal read the op-ed page um, they'll talk about and they you know the Wall Street Journal I mentioned mostly because it has lots of these sort of graphs that show um, all these indicators on GDP and prices and labor prices and uh, real goods prices on CPI those kind of things you know that's a question to ask what do you you tell me that you have a good inflation story you know uh, politicians for the last uh, presidents right, really the last two presidents for the last six years at least have told us that inflation has been under control well we know what inflation is. It's an increase in the price levels. It tends to be uh, driven by, you know, demand side factors, right? And keeping supply and demand in balance. And it has something to do with money market, right? So something about Federal Reserve policy, if you, I don't know how good your macro is. Uh, but we shouldn't be saying, ah, oh, good job. Those things went up. Those things went down. We should be saying, what did they do? And you know how long is this going to be the right play, the right strategy, the right move? Uh, that's what an economist does, right? Because it is always the case that economics and the sort of equilibrium concept never is stationary. It's always moving. It almost always requires that whatever policy is working now um, is not sort of a long-run fix. It's going to have to be uh, either managed or there have to be some other factor. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I don't think it's a surprise to say that economists look at politicians' economic statements and it's not that there's not a lot of economic foundation in those. Now, part of it is because they speak in short um, bites of information and it's, it's fine to assume that they are um, shortcutting some of this, um, but it would be our job as an economist to think through where are the policies, where are the actions uh, that cause something to trend positive. Okay, so that is just in the factual assembly, right? That is just from trying to say, um, we, end up, we see these indicators and they may be good politically or bad politically, but what are the actual actions, okay? Because nobody mandated that this just goes up. 
And so the second step would be an economist would have this role to analyze. So as you sort of sort the facts and try to trace actions to impacts, um, that means we would have identified the supplier demand factor and we should think about it. What policy did that or what policy sort of lever allowed that to happen and was it the best approach? Was there something else that, that could have been done that would have spurred demand more or made producers more productive? And why wasn't that chosen? What were the cost-benefit trade-offs that made this the right one? And is this the right one, right? Uh, it's, you know, these are always questions. And then the other one, right, so the, the most difficult question, were there unintended consequences that may go unnoticed or maybe long-run in nature? Is this one of those situations where there's a short-run um, short indicator change that actually is going to have long-run consequences that are in the opposite direction. So that's the first two and the last two. Uh, number three, recommendations. So you do the, the uh, sort of step one, assemble the facts. Step two, take it through an analytical step. Try to piece together uh, what were the policy actions and, and what are sort of the trade-offs that, that were made. And then finally, recommendations. So given an economics paradigm, which one could we make a claim was an efficient choice, right? So we have the actual choice. We've thought a little bit about the alternatives. Uh, was there one that was more efficient? And if we believe it was more efficient, then we are sort of obliged to say, well, um, only under these conditions is what we're actually doing better than this alternative, which shows a better sort of metric or efficiency. Um, and it requires us to come up with a useful objective, okay? so. Uh, to, to com compare those alternatives. We need a concept of economic efficiency, and that's, this one is difficult because uh, we did talk about this in class when we were thinking about institutions and sort of um, uh, ethics, I think it was, we called it, this idea that there are two big tensions in uh, policy. One is sort of equity, the idea that there should be this sort of fairness in outcomes when government does something the benefits should flow uh, in sort of a fair way, uh, plus the idea that that could be at tension or at odds with um, efficiency, right? With efficiency being defined as making the economy as sort of big and robust and fast moving and growing as possible, right? And so it could be that the more equitable the outcome the slower the growth because not everyone has the same sort of resources and, and uh, access to technology so something that spreads out the gains uh, could actually slow further growth right uh, something that uh, pursues very aggressive growth may have very few sort of notable winners uh, from a policy uh, and then of course we should also so we have to think about the objective and think about what conditions on sort of equity and efficiency we're applying. And then we should also have this recognition of political feasibility. We have alternatives. Can we make the case that they were politically infeasible, that there was no way to make that a real world policy? Uh, the best example I can give you is we've done enough trade the last couple weeks that you should see by now. If we got rid of trade restrictions around the world, it would just be better. Global income would go up and it would probably reach what would be its sort of real world maximum possible level. Uh, the only thing determining the difference in price between here uh, and halfway around the world would be how much it costs to get something from here to halfway around the world. And if it turns out that you're in the place that is better at distributing something that needs to get halfway around the world, <coughs> or somewhere between here and halfway around the world, may not be as efficient as producing, but between you add the transport cost, they can compete with us, then that would be the more efficient one, right? So there is a network sort of solution to global income always that says, treat it as just the, the transportation difference, right? So what can be moved uh, efficiently and what at what cost? And um, that's great, right? We can sit here, I could write a spreadsheet or I have an economic model that I could take away all the tariffs in, um, and we would see. We would see how much income could grow, and we should go. You know, we would write the op-ed, and somebody would just throw it away, right? Because how are you going to get countries 
that are pursuing different objectives, different national objectives, and different sort of equity and efficiency trade-offs to agree that the real solution to everything is to make global income as large as possible. Because now you're not only saying uh, the winners and losers in my country have to be balanced between equity and efficiency, but now you're saying global efficiency, all the losers may be in my country. And no one's going to agree to that. No one's going to agree to be the poor country that has no or very relatively few comparative advantages to draw upon or no national resource base to draw upon. Right? And so that's, you know, that's a political feasibility uh, in a nutshell, if you ever want an example. And then finally, what can economic or what role can economists play? Well, understanding public values and how they change. Okay? And so if we are doing a good job of tracking policy through an economics paradigm, thinking about alternatives, thinking about uh, evaluating those and trying to get sort of use, useful objectives uh, attached to those alternatives, useful ways to measure those competing alternatives, competing policy proposals, then when policy starts changing, we should be good at describing why it changed. What caused something that we formerly viewed as politically infeasible to today become feasible? How did that happen? How did the preferences out there make something uh, move up people's priorities to the idea that now it is uh, favored over so many other things, right? If we ever end up with a balanced budget amendment, uh, it'll likely be because the effects of running national budget deficit for so long have started impacting the way people live. And they realize that correcting that or slowing down deficit growth becomes a huge priority for making the rest of the economy go forward uh, and sort of return to whatever state is better, and we should be able to identify that. So, uh, that is a role economists can play, and keeping in mind that we we play that role because political feasibility means that we are typically moving from something that we would call, right, in a sort of spreadsheet or, you know, textbook type model, economically inefficient outcome to some other one, right? We are never sort of getting what we would call the first best, the, uh, you know, pencil and paper, uh, ignore sort of real world conditions and just say what would be best if we could get it uh, outcome. Uh, and so if we take that to be the case, then we could say that, well, politics is often about choosing least worst among available options. So a politician giving a speech trying to be elected is saying, these are my priorities, these are what I'll fight for, and this is what I want to see happen. Uh, when they get there, they're in this sort of big political machine where they may or may not have a strong voice and get their actions representing you uh, on the table. And so uh, they may be making a choice among A versus B when really they spent most of their time talking about C uh, when they were trying to be elected. Um, yeah, and so it's just the way it works, right? So it could be this sort of idea of least worse. And uh, just keep in mind, we wouldn't call policy problems problems, or we wouldn't call problems that name if there wasn't some idea that we had to come up with policy solutions. If it was simple, we would just call it the way we do things, right? We would just call it the economic plan or something like that. Um, and then, of course, yeah, so the other thing I was saying, tracking policy actions and reactions may help us understand this political value change in the public, which could be very important and very important for, for politics and for understanding new definitions of economic efficiency, new definitions of economic equity. And uh, the example I use there is just uh, think about organic. Uh, so. Lots of people were talking about organic, but until there was some sort of noticeable level for market demand on the market demand side that sort of created price premiums, we didn't get a lot of policy action on part on organic. A lot of people saying, okay, now we need certification programs. We need uh, research to back this up and to make sure that some of the claims we're making uh, can hold up, right? I mean, because uh, that is how those things tend to go, right? So that's something you can track quite well through the economics. You can see 
the first reports of niche markets and then premiums arising uh, and then the policy activity follows along because if people are doing it uh, in their choices in everyday life they're going to expect sort of the public expenditure on uh, research and on policies to ensure uh, this piece of the economic sort of uh, uh, network they engage with to be maintained. Um, just a final thought or set of thoughts for you just so policy politics it's it's one of those places where you'll continually encounter economic concepts in real life uh, and I don't know what I was going to say here except I know what's missing so maybe that was it uh, it's where it'll be there's be some variety right so most of you're going to be on career tracks where you're going to get good at a few things and you'll branch out and, and maybe see some other things but they're mostly going to be uh, sort of managerial organizational uh, sort of business decision. The decisions are going to be in sort of narrow space. Uh, but in economics, as your life changes and you, you know, go through these different stages uh, that, that we all kind of go through, uh, the policy that you sort of care about and pay attention to may change, and it may give you this sort of opportunity to think about economics uh, and its role uh, differently. Uh, and then, of course, it's not a tool to replace yours or anyone's personal values. So we could never look at someone and say, I can't believe you voted for that or you support that because economically it makes no sense. Well, they don't have to make sense. They don't have to value economic outcomes the same way as anyone else. And that means that economics can never be this sort of scoreboard that we use to say which politician beat some other politician, which policy approach beat some other one. Uh, but we can always say, uh, here's how economics would compare these. Why didn't we get the economics sort of rating of these things? And that comes from the value side of problems. Um, yeah, and then I'll just encourage you, go hit some walls, right? So you'll think about problems that the economics uh, aren't easy to see. And I'll just say, if it interests you and you want to sort of dig into those and think about whether... Uh, you know, where it most often happens is someone that I don't, to, to me, someone I don't normally agree with on policy says something that makes sense to me, and then I want to, to see why that made sense, right? You know, someone I didn't think I, I had this sort of value association with as a politician, go through it, uh, and maybe you'll, maybe you'll see why that sort of, at a, from a sort of core position on the outcomes they expect to come from their policy match up what your sort of vision would be and what you might value. So look through those, you know, and, and read explanatory, uh, you know, resources, you know, not, not a textbook, but there are plenty of sort of popular fiction and blogs that really just go around trying to explain um, sort of how pieces of the economy work, and I think they're mostly good. Um, I think Wikipedia is a great resource, so it's a weak source. You would never want to cite it. Um, because you never know what's in there at any one time, but as a resource, most people don't go in and, and change it so that demand is upward sloping, right? Uh, it's, it's typically well maintained as a sort of encyclopedia of, you know, so if you do perhaps, perhaps get interested in the Federal Reserve and what role they play in inflation, uh, it's, it's a really, really great place to start. Uh, and then, of course, they have lots of uh, citations and links. It's a great uh, a way to read things. Um, I do think you have strong economics foundations. I've, I've read enough of what you've written and seen enough of what you've um, understood to know that uh, uh, you should be able to take that and absorb economic concepts as they hit you, uh, you know, and as you encounter them. Uh, just keep in mind the goal in most economics problems or most, f sorry, framing problems in economics terms means trying to trying to find some marginal trade-off comparison. Try to figure out what the gain loss is of that last unit or uh, sort of this versus that alternative. And I'll just encourage you finally to sort of teach and explain to others what you've learned. If you've invested in it, uh, then you had enough interest to do it. Someone else may, uh, may gain from that too. And of course, uh, if you are trying to sort of continue to learn economics and think about it, problems in, in in terms of economics, your grasp will just become better when you're forced to explain uh, yourself. Thanks for uh, this semester. It's uh, been fun, and I really appreciate all the attention, uh, all the effort uh, you've written 
uh, quite a few things. You've prepared a lot, and uh, I, you know I've certainly benefited from it, from seeing how you uh, see things. Uh, so hopefully this class will continue to get better and better for it, and uh, I hope you're uh, a little better for uh, having been in it. Uh, thanks. There is a, a quiz that you should jump over to and uh, take on this lecture, and uh, good luck with your finals and, and all the rest.